Hey, everybody. Happy New Year. It's our first episode of the New Year, Rosie. Yep. Yeah. All right. It's 2020, and we're excited about what's coming down the road for us and for you and your beautiful ears to listen to as we continue this podcast. On this episode of the podcast, Rosie, we're going to be talking about a man, a rocket, a friend, and a couple of adulterous affairs in a pentagram. I'm just going to leave it at that. So, Okay. I guess some <laughs> of those fit. Yeah. All right. So I would just say sit back, grab a coffee, and enjoy. You're listening to the All Out War Podcast. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to our first podcast episode of 2020. Rosie, how are you doing, man? I'm doing well. It's 2020, dude. It is. It's 2020. It's a new year. Do you believe in New Year's resolutions? Nope. (laughs) (laughs) Me either, dude. (laughs) I hate New Year's resolutions. In fact, I read a study one time that uh, 90% of New Year's resolutions do not make it past week four. So by February. One month, yeah. By February, they're done. People have given up. They've moved back. They're back into their old habits. Yeah, it makes sense. So, yeah, I mean, that's why gyms, gym memberships, like they, they make all this money. If you go in March, nobody's there. Yeah. Because they've given up on their new body. They're new, new year, new me, right? That's true. Did you get a, that's your watch, making those beeps. Did you get a new watch for Christmas? I did get, I got a new watch for my birthday, yeah. Oh, yeah, for your birthday? Yeah. What is that, a little smart watch you got there? Uh, It's a Suunto 9. (laughs) Oh, nice. It's not, it's a smart watch, but it's like, it's, it's not like a smart watch. Okay. Yeah. But it syncs with your phone and stuff. Yeah. That's cool. It's got, I mean. Yeah, is it's it, like a. It's made for triathletes, which I am not. So it's a waterproof one. Oh yeah, but this is made for like ultra marathon runners. Yeah. Oh my god. It's going all kinds of crazy. I don't know. Places. Turn off the. <laughs> I'll put on do not disturb. I'm sorry. I didn't it's, think about that. It's telling you to run. You need to run. Yeah. You haven't biked. That's pretty cool though. My I have like first generation Apple Watch. Yeah. It's not waterproof. Oh. It's, it's yeah. I I that's the one thing I don't like about it. I know the new ones are. Yeah. Which is cool. All right, sorry. We're good. We uh, had the battery last 17 days. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. That's really good. Yeah. It, these are like indestructible. Cool. Sunto. S-U-U-N-T-O. Sunto. Yeah. So if you, uh, Sunto, if you're listening, we will gladly. Um... <laughs> <laughs> They're expensive watches. So yeah, I'll take a free one. Yeah. Well, give us a couple to try out. Yeah. Um, yeah, man. So happy new year. Happy <laughs> birthday. Merry Christmas. All that good stuff. Thank you. I think we ended, we ended the year with a an absolute banger and it was uh dr michael heiser yes that was amazing and uh we had so much fun you and i were giddy leading up to that knowing knowing that we had booked him waiting for that yeah and then finally having him on yeah because we had it took us like six months to figure out when we could actually yeah he's a busy man yes and and not only is he a busy man but he's got a lot of changes happening right now and he literally fit us in before he moves like he's like after Christmas, before I move, yeah. <laughs> here's the deal. I've got this window, and I'll fit you in for an hour, which was so awesome. Yeah. But uh, And so if you haven't listened to Dr. Michael Heiser, you need to go back and listen to that and share it with your friends and all. It's a great, great episode. He's a genius guy. He is. Love yes. him. So so on this episode, we are going to have, uh, well, you know, the question that I would say is what does, oh, wait. We're not even getting. We need to do some other stuff first. There's a whole bunch of There's stuff. A, I'm just like, let's get into it, right? Yeah. It's a new year. Let's do this. Wait a second. What is that? Oh, we're gonna do that. Okay. Let me pull well, that. you know. I was ready to tell you something, but oh, you were. Yeah, that's right. I'm sorry. It's okay. Do you want me to? So stop? we're 31 weeks pregnant. Okay. The baby. It's as yeah. big as a coconut. Coconut. Uh, we got nine weeks to go. Put the lime in the coconut. Oh, 16 inches, 3.2 pounds. The baby's brain 
is making connections and they're developing at a rapid pace. That's a good thing since he has to make billions of them. That's what it says. He. I didn't say that. Yeah, well. Uh, your baby, baby's sleepy, it's drowsy, puts in long, longer stretches of snooze time, specifically REM sleep. Nice. Uh, want them to wake up, eat or drink something sugary. <laughs> and uh, also it says the baby's brain can already process information and pick up signals from all five senses. Wow. Yeah. So he, uh, it says, why is he sleeping so much? Because so he can grow because he's got to put on three to five pounds. Or she. Three to five pounds for what? Per week? No, just before. <laughs> just before. Uh, before birth. Yeah, it, it's already at three pounds. I don't think you got a baby We're that getting, puts on nine. So we got nine weeks. Yeah. You put in three to five pounds. Let's do <laughs> three <laughs> times 18 pound baby. 27. Yeah. Plus three. Yeah. A 30 pound baby. That's right. a pretty big baby. I don't think the baby's. <laughs> that baby's coming out walking. Yeah. <laughs> hey, mom. <laughs> the, the old Will Ferrell skit. Do you remember that? No. It comes out. And he's like a businessman. <laughs> and then he's like, thank you, doctor. And then they give him the suit. And he just like goes out. Full grown. Yeah. Uh, that's funny. Yeah. Anyways. That's, that's awesome, man. So that's the baby. So 31. We're getting close. We are getting close. I wonder if we have any of those Braxton Hicks uh, things. I don't know what that means. Those are, those are uh, what is it called when they start to go in, into labor? When they have like the um, shoot. I don't know. I've never had a baby. Oh, uh, well, I've had, my wife's had three. And so you should know this. Yeah. But she had Braxton Hicks. That's what I'm trying to think. I can't think of what they're exactly. It's when you have like, um, when your body. Contractions? Yeah. Contractions. There oh, you go. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, no, it's a contraction that they get that's like pre, pre-birth and like they're early. And so um, it's like the body's saying, I'm ready. Let's do this. But the baby's right. not ready. So you got to get them synced up. Anyways. Gotcha. Yeah. I mean, gosh, I can't even remember contractions. Of course, my last baby was born 14 years ago, so yeah. it's easy to forget things. And sometimes, you know... Well, that's right. I mean, sometimes it's... Smoking that sticky, sticky green stuff. Yeah, <laughs> right. You're not going to remember that. <laughs> you're not going to remember contractions. I had to get it in for the first one of the new year. It was good. We had to. Why don't you throw another one in? Smoking that sticky, sticky green stuff. Yeah, oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was watching that where we pulled that clip from. I was watching that YouTube the other day, laughing. <laughs> <laughs> the whole clip just made me laugh. It's so good. Oh man! So, uh, what were you gonna say? You're well, gonna ask me what I know. What do you know, man? Oh, hey, yeah. <laughs> I wasn't sure if that's what you were referring yeah. to when you were saying you're gonna say something or oh, not. Yeah. Hey, did you know that Russia and Japan are still at war <laughs> on paper? <laughs> technically, <laughs> they've never had a uh, ceasefire. Ooh. Or technically, they never like came to agreement that they are not in war anymore. From, you know, like they sign a from a World treaty. War II. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And also in uh, a, another kind of did you know? Yeah. Uh, Virginia, we're at war mm-hmm. against Minnesota because they stole a flag, Wait. a Confederate flag, <laughs> and they've held on to it for more than a century. We need to go get it. We do need to go get it. We need to go get our flag back. Yes. Let's go. Let's go. Well, we shouldn't tell it on <laughs> tell on, on the them. public. <laughs> where is the flag? Do, do we know where the flag is? Uh, yeah, and we've been suing them. What? It says, for 100 years, Virginia has been asking for it back, even suing for it, as a bunch of Virginian <laughs> reenactors tried to do in 1998. Then Attorney General Hubert Humphrey III told them to go fly a kite. <laughs> Said in... 2000, Virginia legislators got involved asking Governor Jesse Ventura to return their captured icon. Why, he asked. We won. (laughs) (laughs) Um, We won. Yeah. So they look, we have to, it's got to be. It's on public display. I don't think we can get it. Dude, covert. We got to get this thing. Yeah. Well, here's the history. Listeners, listeners. Okay. Go get our Confederate flag for Virginia. (laughs) Mail it to us. (laughs) And we'll deliver it to the governor of Virginia. Yeah, we'll it'll be, be amazing. Well, we don't want to give it to no, f- this not governor. Northam. No, no. He's we'll hold on to it till we'll wait till we get a good we'll, conservative. When the si- when the Civil War II kicks off here in Virginia, that's right. We'll be riding with it. <laughs> yeah, we'll hold it out in the banner. Yeah. Oh man. Well, here here it is. It says it came into Minnesota Minnesotan hands in 1863 when first Minnesota Private Marshal Sherman captured it during the bloodbath at Gettysburg. Hmm. So he stole it. 
Wow. I stole it in uh, Kittysburg. Took it, took it with them. Yeah. So there you go. Minnesota. Yeah. All right. I think we've killed enough time. Yeah. So you got that down. You got the baby. I guess we should get into this podcast. What do you think? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to ask you a question. What do rockets, Aleister Crowley, and Scientology have to do with each other? Oh, I don't know. Why don't you tell me? I will tell you the name of an individual, and his name is Jack Parsons. <laughs> That's what we're going to be talking about Wait, today. Wait, you wrote down the joke, and you didn't even present it well. <laughs> well, That was for a presentation. <laughs> You're like, well, I'm going <laughs> to... Wait, wait, like hold on. I never explain. wrote it down. I just okay. said, I just said, I think I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna open this way. Oh, I thought you, I thought you were writing it down. No, I don't write, I don't write anything down. I was like, oh, I'm a nerd. Let me pull up my glasses here. And you're like, well, the name of a person that I'm about to tell you is gonna tie it all in together. Oh, be quiet. Like, <laughs> whatever, dude. So. All right. Well, since uh, <laughs> since you're making fun of me, you get to you get to start this whole little no, little jazz show. Uh, I'm just poking <laughs> fun. So. Jack Parsons, man, this guy, uh, you know, he he's a very, very interesting character. Yes. And a uh, very dark person. Mm -hmm. I'll say that. Um, but uh, you've been doing some research on him. I've done a little bit of research on him. Yeah. There's a lot of information about him you can find, you know, just on the Internet and stuff. But uh, you've got some cool information we thought it'd be interesting and fun to talk about uh, because it's so strange. Yeah. And we're going to do a series. I should probably set this up, too. We're going to be doing a series of... Uh, podcasts throughout 2020 here and there spatterings of them speckled uh, yeah. our podcasts will be speckled with them of uh, just uh, individuals of unique individuals strange individuals of history um, so this ties in with um, another person that oh, we'll, I didn't know we, we were going to do that well I mean we already <laughs> we already decided that we were going to talk about Aleister Crowley yeah and um, so we'll be talking about him and um, so uh, we've got some people that, that we'll, we'll be talking about uh, you know through 2020 yeah and uh, so let's talk about Jack Parsons okay all right what do you know no I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> do you want me to do a little introduction yeah yeah come all on right, so I want you to okay well so why do we care about Jack Parsons question anyone anyone know <laughs> well, okay we care about Jack Parsons because he happened to pioneer the advancement of of uh, liquid and solid jet fuel. So he basically, he was this jet propulsion scientist back in uh, like the 30s and 40s, uh, back when we were trying to make rockets, right? And he basically was one, one of the cutting edge scientists in the world, and he basically helped invent solid and uh, liquid rocket fuel, the yeah. rocket fuel that we still use to this day. Modern rocket fuel, that's right. Modern rocket fuel, the way that we put rocket ships into the moon, how we get them into orbit, how we get satellites. Yeah. He was, like, one of the biggest guys that helped contribute to that. So he's basically one of the most important uh, people in modern science rocketry. Yeah. Rocket science. Yeah. Literally a rocket scientist that <laughs> helped us, uh, you know, beat everybody else. <laughs> so... That's right. And yeah. So so he's a unique I don't want to get too too much of his story, but that's basically what we're talking about is why are we even talking about this guy? He's kind of a crazy guy. But you have to so we're gonna juxtapose so have in your mind this rocket scientist who revolutionized everything in the world in the in the way of rockets. And then keep that in mind as we go through the rest of this story that we're gonna read. Yeah. Yeah. Um so that's basically who Jack Parsons was. Um, do you, I, I have some stuff since you mentioned Aleister Crowley. Yeah. Aleister Crowley does come into the story, as does, did you say Scientology? I did. As does the founder of Scientology, L. Ron, L. Ron, L. Ron Hubbard. L, I say R. Ron L. Hubbard. It's L. Ron Hubbard. L. Ron Hubbard, yeah. yeah. Um, so most people know who L. Ron Hubbard is. We don't really have to, I don't have, I don't have anything about him, but he was the founder of Scientology. He was a science fiction writer. If you don't know anything about science, Scientology, it's fake. It's all made up. Uh, L. Ron Hubbard was a science fiction writer. He wasn't very good, and uh, he, but he always wanted to use this megalomaniac that wanted to make a lot of money, mm -hmm. and he discovered if he could make a religion, then that's a lot easier. <laughs> it's a lot easier <laughs> to make money when you have a religion as opposed to being a real a, job, <laughs> a, ba a bad science fiction writer. Right. Yeah. Um. So that's that's what he did. 
And this, when he interacted with all these guys, this was before Scientology took place. So just keep that in mind. Yeah. Um, so Aleister Crowley, and I think we're, you said we're going to do a whole episode on Aleister Crowley. Yeah. Um, but this is just the background um, of Aleister Crowley, just a real short one. Um, so he was born October 12th, 1875, and he died December 1st, 1947. He was an English occultist, ceremonial magician, poet, painter, novelist, and mountaineer. Um, He founded the religion of Thelema, uh, and he identified himself as a prophet entrusted with guiding humanity into the Eon of Horus in the early 20th century. The Eon of Horus. Yeah. Yeah. That's a a big cultic thing. Yeah. So... uh, What's important about him, he started, uh, he's, they, they called him the wickedest man in the world at the time. Dude was evil, like straight evil. Yeah. So he was pra- just, practiced all kinds of magic. Just and... really, yeah. Well, yeah. And we'll get into the crazy stuff, but <laughs> yeah. So he, that's who this guy was. He was very, he came from a wealthy family in England and then became one of the most evil, uh, occultist, just evil, wickedest man alive. So, so that's, that's Alistair Crowley. That's Alistair Crowley. Right. And he was good friends with old Jack. Had, yeah. Had a lot of influence on old Jack. Yeah. Cool. So uh, I'll say that he, uh, one of the things that we're going to talk about is the, uh, so it says in eight, 1912, uh, he was initiated into, uh, Alistair Crowley was initiated into an esoteric order, which was called the Ordo Templi Orentis. Mm-hmm. So he didn't found that, but he was one of the most influential guys that kind of took it over. Yeah. After he was, um, so was the, in it. We'll 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 refer to that as the OTO. Yeah, I think that's now. what it. But uh, is is that like a secret society or is it just a straight up like cult, like cult? It says it was like an esoteric order. Okay, so, so it's, it's a blend, maybe. Well, I guess they would say it was like a. You can think of it as like a church, but they wouldn't call it a church because. So they're, not, they're it, not Christians. It was more like a secret society then. I don't think they're very secret about it. Okay. All right. So it's just a, a church. Okay. Yeah. Just, so, a, just a weird church. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So you want to start reading? Sure. You want me to? I can I can I can start off. Okay. Uh <clears throat> so this is uh we're gonna talk a little bit about Jack Parsons. His name is John Whiteside Parsons, born on October second, nineteen fourteen in Los Angeles, California. His mother and father separated while he was quite young, and Parsons said later that, his, that this left him with a hatred of authority and a spirit of revolution, as well as an opedial attachment. Oedipal. Yes, that too. <laughs> an Oedip- Oedipal. I've never even seen that word before. The Oedipus complex? You haven't heard of oh, that? Oh, yes, I've heard of that. So, so I've just never really seen it written out like that. Oh, yeah. So uh, he had an, an Oedipal attachment to his mother. Uh, he felt withdrawn and isolated as a child and was bullied by other children. This gave him he thought the requisite contempt for the crowd and for group mores. Parsons was born into a rich family and sometimes in his youth, he was referred to as a loss of family fortune. This loss must only have been temporary one though, perhaps caused by the breakup of his family. Since the 1940s, he inherited from his father, a large Victorian style mansion in the well-to-do area of Pasadena. During adolescence, Parsons developed an interest in science, especially physics and chemistry. And in fact, he went on to develop a career as a brilliant scientist in the fields of explosive and rocket fuel technology. His achievements as a scientist were such that the Americans named a lunar crater after him when they came to claim that territory for their own. Appropriately enough, Crater Parsons is on the dark side of the moon. (laughs) That's pretty interesting. Do you want me to keep going? Sure. Sure. Parsons made contact with Aleister Crowley, uh, Aleister Crowley's magical lodges, the OTO, which we had just talked about, and the AA in December of 1938 while visiting Agape Lodge of the OTO in California. He was, he was taken along by one of his fellow scientists at the time of a time Agape Lodge used to give weekly performances of the Gnostic Catholic Mass. Seeing this as both a sacramental and recruiting front, uh, Agape Lodge was by then a moderately thriving and expanding Concern, uh, concern, having been found in the, founded in the mid-20s by Wilfred T. Smith and 
expatriate Englishman. Smith had many years earlier been a, an associate of Charles Stanfield Jones, or Frater Akkad, in Vancouver, Canada. Crowley seems to have had at least to being with a high regard for Smith and expected great things of him. Over the years, however, he grew increasingly disillusioned. Crowley felt that the OTO should have flowered in California, given imaginative leadership. Smith was simply not capable of delivering. He thought and perhaps even deliberately impeded things. By the time uh, that Parsons joined the lodge in 1939, together with his wife Helen, relations between Smith and Crowley were already uh, t in terminal decline, and Crowley was, was casting around for someone else to take over leadership of the lodge. One of the items in the York collection at the Warburg Institute is a collection of over 200 letters exchanged between Crowley and Smith in which they in which the steady decline in their relationship is starkly illustrated. You want to take over there? Yeah. Cool. <clears throat> at this time, the lodge was firmly in the grip of Smith and his mistress, Regina Call. They were very authoritarian and ruled things with a proverbial rod of iron. At the weekly performances of the Mass, Smith was the priest and Regina Call the priestess. The Parsons were initiated in, into the OTO in 1939, and like many entrants of the time, they took up membership in the AA as well. So the AA is just another spiritual organization mm -hmm. that was started by Crowley, just so you guys know. Uh, Jack Parsons took as his motto, Thalema, uh, some bunch of Latin words I'm not going to try <laughs> to say. Uh, an interesting hybrid phrase which conveys the intention of attaining. Which is some more esoteric nonsense. It doesn't mean anything. The lema through the nuptials of love, the initials transliterated into Hebrew gave him mag gave his magical number to 10. Hmm. 210. He seems to have made quite the impression on his fellow members. Jane Wolfe, who had spent some time with Crawley at Cephalu, was an active member at the lodge at the time. The following entry is from her magical record during December 1940. Unknown to me, John Whiteside Parsons, a newcomer, a newcomer began, began astral travels. This knowledge decided Regina to undertake similar work, all of which I learned after making my own decision. So the time must be propitious. Why, why do all these old people in... Yeah, why I know. can't they just write normal, reg, normal English? Right. Hey, people in the 1930s, how about you start writing normal I th English? I think it was still the influence of old English that was like lingering yeah. in the well, why don't you just, literary world. We're in America. Speak like a normal American. Whoa. Okay. All right. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I'm just getting mad at this old woman. <laughs> uh, incidentally, I take Jack Parsons to be the child who shall behold them all, Ooh. which is part of their teaching. Mm -hmm. So she notices that he might be one of these guys that Special. they were... Yeah, looking for. 26 years of age, 6'2", vital, potentially bisexual at the very least, is what this woman said. At the very least. Yeah. University of the State of California and Caltech now engaged in Caltech chemical laboratories developing bigger and better explosives for Uncle Sam. Mm. Travels under sealed orders from the government. Writes poetry, sensuous only, he says. Lover of music, and he seems to know thoroughly. Which he seems to know thoroughly. I seem, I see him as the real successor of Therion, passionate and has made the vilest analyses result in species of exaltation <laughs> after the event. All right, some of the stuff they're talking about magical, yeah, magical stuff that doesn't make sense. Right, I have no idea about this. Yeah, so just listener, take some of these things when we just try to read through them. We're gonna, this this piece that we're reading has letters that it says before is yeah. made up with this letters. So just take some of this stuff with a grain of salt and I have no idea what that means. Yeah, yeah. Has had He's had mystical experiences which gave him a sense of equality all around, although he's hierarchical in feeling and in the established order. Cool. That's the end of her first letter. Yeah. Jack Parsons seems to have had something of a reverential attitude towards Smith, perhaps seeing as him as some sort of father figure. The relationship there seems to have had a bit of ambiguity. In later years, he described how he felt an alternate attraction and a repulsion where Smith was concerned. And Smith, wherever his limitations and faults, was evidently a charismatic man. 
Parsons evidently made a strong impression on Smith. In a letter to Crawley during March 1941, Smith wrote, I think I have had, I think I have at last a really excellent man, John Parsons. And starting next, next Tuesday, he begins a course of talks with a view to enlarging our scope. He has an excellent mind and m much better intellect than myself. Oh, yes. I know it would not necessarily, not, I know it would not necessarily have to be very good to be better than mine. <laughs> Jack Parsons is going to be valuable. I feel sure we are going to move ahead in spite of Max Schneider's continual efforts to discredit me. He still exhibits your letters as proof that I am a number one SOB. <laughs> I thought you were going to write him to tell him to clamp down. End of the, that letter. Yeah. The last sentence of this quotation throws light on an important factor in the affairs of the Agape Lodge. The turmoil and personal friction that was a constant emotional back, backdrop, which seems finally to have invalidated all of their efforts. The lodge was constantly riven by a personal feuding and upheaval, and Crowley's influence over the course of events seems in reality to have been marginal. The nucleus of the Agape Lodge was some sort of forerunner of a hippie commune. Apart from anything else, Smith appears to have regarded the women members of the lodge as constituting his personal harem, and of course this added to the friction. Crowley was in correspondence with many of the members at this time and seems to some extent to have encouraged people to tell tales on each other. You want to pick it up? Sure. Yeah. In his attempt to assert authority over the lodge generally, and Smith in particular, Crowley was frustrated by the loyalty, despite all the bitchiness, to Smith and Call. On the face of it, he should have been able to exert his authority easily enough. Carl Germer, his trusted right-hand man, was in New York while his colleague was in his colleague from the Cephalu days. I'm not sure where, what his Cephalu is. I guess that was an area. Jane Wolfe was a member of the lodge. Jane Wolfe was of the same age as Crowley, but was weak and indecisive. Despite the glamour of that time and, and mystery now lend the Agape Lodge of the 1930s and 40s, the reality seems to have been a mess. Although Crowley grew increasingly despairing and, in, of, of, and impatient with Smith and saw all too clearly the need to replace him as the head of the Agape Lodge, the problem for Crowley, quite apart from how to get rid of Smith, was with whom to replace him. In the course of the letter to Crowley on March 1942, Jane Wolfe made her recommendations. Incidentally, I believe Jack Parsons, who is devoted to, and then um, for some reason, I don't have the next part of that on my PDF that you gave me, but <laughs> he is <laughs> devoted to Wilfred. Wilfred. Oh, okay. There you go. I got. Okay. I didn't realize it didn't look like it matched. So, incidentally, I believe Jack Parsons, who is devoted to Wilfred, to be the coming leader, with Wilfred in advisory capacity. I hope. To get two together someday, although your your present activities in England seem to have postponed the date of your coming to us. Jack, by the way, comes comes in through some inner experience, but mostly perhaps though the world through the though the world of science. That is, he is he was sold on the book of the law because it foretold foretold Einstein Heisenberg, whose work is not permitted in Russia the quantum field folks, whose work uh, is alongside the factor of infinite and unknown lines, etc. You two would have a whale of, of a lot of things to talk over. He and Helen are, are lock, stock, and barrel for the order. By 1943, Crowley, Crowley appeared to have decided that some definite course of action was necessary to get rid of Smith and that his continued presence in the lodge was harmful. In the letter in May in 1943 to a member called Roy Leffingwell, he wrote, I think that Smith is quite hopeless. I am quite satisfied with what you say about his reaction to your family. It is all very well, but Smith has apparently nothing else in his mind. He appears to be using the order as a happy hunting ground for affairs. You say the same thing, and I have no doubt that it is quite correct. I think we must get rid of him once and for all, and this will include the Parsons unless they disassociate themselves immediately from him without reservations. At this time, Helen Parsons was having an affair with Smith and also supplanting Regina Call 
as priestess of the, in the public performances of the Gnostic Mass. Jack Parsons retained his strong feelings of loyalty towards Smith, although perhaps a little confused by events. Crowley determined to get rid of, the, of Smith, viewed with his concern the extent to which Parsons, of which he seemed to have held high opinion, was under the spell of Smith. While having a high regard for Parsons, Crowley was also keenly aware of his faults, which he hoped Parsons would outgrow in the course of time and experience. In view of subsequent events in the life of Parsons, these perceptions are interesting and important. Once again, they can be best conveyed by extracts from several letters that Crowley wrote in a letter of July 1943 to Max Schneider. We read, As to Jack, I think he is perfectly all right at the bottom of everything, but he is very young, and he, he, and he has at present nothing like the strength to deal with the matters within this jurisdiction objectively. In the course of the letter, Jane Wolfe in December 1943, Crowley made the following assessment. Jack is objective. Smith is out in a, in a fair class A. Anything or anybody who communicates with him in any way is out also. And that, and that is that. <laughs> and the best plan is to sponge the whole slate clean and to get to work to build up Thelma on, build up Thelma on sound principles. And no more of this brothel building. Let us use marble, not rotten old boards. Jack's trouble is his weakness and his romantic side. The poet is at present a hindrance. He gets a kick from some magazine trash or an occult novel. If only he knew how they were concocted. The dash and dashes off in wild pursuit. He must learn that the sparkle of the champagne is based on, on sound wine, pumping carbonic uh, carbonic acid and <laughs> into urine is not the same thing. I wish to God I had for him six months, even three, with a hustle to train in, will, in discipline. He must understand that fine and fiery flashes of spirit come from the organization of matter, from the drilling of every function in every bodily organ until it has become so regular as to be automatic and carried on by itself down in the unconscious. It is it is the steadiness of one's heart that enables one to endure the rapture of great passion. One doesn't want the vital functions to be excitable. Want me to take over? Sure. Let's uh, recap real quick, though. So there's just a lot of tensions happening between, um, just between uh, Crowley and Smith, and unfortunately, you have uh, you have Parsons who's feeling loyal to Smith because he's the one who got him got him into the OTO. Yeah, and uh, and then you have this affair going on with Parsons' wife, and, uh, and the leader of the the, <laughs> the leader, leader of, of the lodge. Yeah, leader of the lodge. So there's like this intertwined uh, romance that's affair and all you know, it's adultery and it's, it's just bad. Yeah, and you'll see that Crowley is writing to different people mm -hmm. to all try to figure out what's going on and or, trying to maneuver all these people into place to get rid of Smith. Yeah. He's just manipulating stuff. Yeah. Totally. From evil. England. From through it. letters. Just That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, so this is still Crowley, one of his letters. <laughs> in February 1944, he wrote in somewhat similar spirit to Mr. and Mrs. Burlingham, who were lodge members. I am very glad indeed of your offer to co cooperate practic practicality in any way possible. I have left Jack Parsons in charge. He is quite all right in essence, but very young and easily swayed by passing influences. I shall look to you to help in keeping him up to the mark. And more expansively, in the course of a letter to Jack Parsons himself in March 1946. I am particularly interested in what you have written to me about the elemental, because for some little while past I have been endeavoring to intervene personally on your behalf. I would ha I would I oh my goodness. <laughs> I would, however, have you recall Levi's aphorism. The love of the magus for such beings is, is insensaint and may destroy him. So he's saying if you have love for the stuff, it's going to ultimately destroy you. Yeah. The magic. It seems to me that there is a danger in your sensitiveness upsetting your balance. Any, es any experience that comes your way, you have a tendency to overestimate. The first fine careless rapture wears off in a month or so, and then some other experience comes along and carries you off on its back. 
Meanwhile, you have neglected and bewildered those who are dependent upon you, either from above or from below. Hmm. I will ask that you bear in mind that you have one fulcrum for all your level level levers, and that is your original oath to devote yourself to raising mankind. All experiences, all efforts must be referred to this. As long as it remains unshaken, you cannot go wrong, for by its own stability, it will bring you back from any tendency to excess. At the same time, you being as sensitive as you are, it behooves you to move to be more on your guard than would be the case with the majority of people. Resolved through Crowley t- was to get rid of Smith, and it was a long and difficult maneuver, and had to be approached piecemeal at first. Many of the lodge members remained loyal to Smith and were reluctant to see him go. Smith was only too happy to hang on in the hope that what he saw as a popular opinion would persuade Crowley to retain him after all. Throughout all this, Smith Smith seemed unable to understand the depths of Crowley's hostility towards him. His letters to Crowley during this period carry the tone, whether implicitly or explicitly, of some wretch having to bear the gratuitous beatings of his master. Some sort of dual authority apparently operated between Smith and Parsons for a while, to the reluctance of Parsons, himself still still much a Smith loyalist. Eventually, Crowley seems to have hit upon a novel way to remove Smith. He declared that Smith was the avatar of some god (laughs) and should go away on a magical retirement until (laughs) he had realized his true identity. That's pretty cunning, isn't it? Yeah. (laughs) To this end, Crowley wrote a document of of instruction for Smith to follow. It's called Lieber 132. Smith made an attempt on at this operation, but had no joy at all in plumbing the depths of his divinity. <laughs> it seems doubtful if Crawley intended him to. I have seen this letter from Crawley to an American correspondent at the time, in which Crowley came as close as he could to admitting the Machiavellian thrust of the whole affair. The way was now clear, clear for Crowley to appoint Parsons as a head of the Agape Lodge. If he had hoped that the lodge would become more stable with, without Smith in charge, However, he was wrong. Smith continued to live there for some time, despite all attempts by Crowley and Germer to declare him a leper, contract with whom would warrant immediate expulsion. That's kind of a, an interesting thing that might pop up in Scientology. Interesting, yeah. yeah. So huh. think about that. Yeah. Uh, in late 1943, he wrote to Crowley, attacking him on this point and offering his resignation. Crowley's esteem of Parsons had be, had to be gauged from the fact that he declined to accept his resignation and asked Parsons to reconsider. Parsons agreed to remain a, as head of the lodge. Cool. Parsons by this time had inherited a large Victorian-style mansion from his father in the well-to-do area of Pasadena. He needed to rent out some rooms in order to make ends meet, and he scandalized the neighborhood by ensuring that only bohemians <laughs> and eccentrics were taken on. By the summer of 1943, Helen had a, a child by Smith, and a divorce with Jack was in the air. <laughs> Parsons took up with Helen's younger sister, Sarah Northrup, known as Betty. His, so it's his sister-in-law. <laughs> yeah. Or his wife's younger sister. Okay, yeah. So His ex-wife's younger sister. So Crawley sister. kicked out Smith. Kicked out Smith. But he still hung around. But Smith still hung around. Like a leper. Jack was in charge of the lodge, but wouldn't kick Smith out. Right. So then Jack tells Alistair he wants to leave. And J- and Alistair's like, no, 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 Jack, you're staying. Right. So Jack's wife has a child with Smith. She had an affair. Yep. Yep. She had, they had a child. She was going to divorce Jack. So then Jack gets with his wife's sister. That's right. That's, so that's like vengeance, vengeance. Boom, boom, boom. Exactly. Wow. All right. This time it was was one of turmoil for the Parsons to say, <laughs> yeah, to say the least. In a le- later document, analysis by the master of the temple, Parsons alludes to this period and himself in the detached third person. Betty served to effect a transference from Helen at a critical period. Had this not ac- occurred, your rep- repressed homosexual component could have caused serious disorder. Your passion for Betty also gave you the magical force needed at the time. <laughs> And the act of adultery tinged with incest seemed your magical confirmation in the law of Thelema. Wow. Yeah, so 
He's a kind of a weird dude. Tinged with incest. I mean, yeah. it's kind of weird. It's, yeah. but Not quite, but. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we get a further glimpse of Parsons. But, okay. Uh, he did say something about his homosexual. Uh, uh, it says, you repressed homosexual component could have caused serious disorder. Yeah. Wow. So he kind of. He's admitting he's got this repressed homosexual desire. Yeah, which it seems like we wrote a, read about earlier. Yeah. People seem to know. Yeah, <laughs> Everyone I, else seemed to know. Maybe he was quite flamboyant. Yeah. I don't know. He broadcasted. Yeah. We get a further glimpse of Parsons' uncertainty in the course of a letter from Jane Wolfe to Crawley early in 1945. Last evening, when Jack brought me these various papers for me to post to you, I saw for the first time the small boy or child. It is that he is bewildered, that it is bewildered, does not know how or when to take hold in this matter or where, and is completely bowed, bowled over by the ruthlessness of Smith. Smith, who has a master hand when it comes to dealing with this boy. Hmm. Parsons was also beginning to be seen in something of a sinister light. In the course of a letter to Carl Germer, Jane Wolfe wrote about the strange atmosphere that was manifesting. The following comes from the end of 1945. There is also there is, oh, there is something strange going on, quite apart from Smith. There is always Betty, remember, who hates Smith. But our own Jack is enamored with witchcraft, the home fort, voodoo from the start he always wanted to evoke something no matter what that i am inclined to think as long as he got the result according to mika yesterday he has had a result an elemental he doesn't know what to do with from that statement of hers it must bother him at least somewhat you want to read over sure phyllis seckler who's from whose account this passage of jane wolf's has been drawn adds her own memories to this Mika also reported to Jane that other that another per, two persons always had to do a lot of bashing, banishing in the house. They were sensitive and knew there was something alien and amical, and, and, and amical <laughs> was there. Uh, when I had been there during the summer of 1944, I also knew there was there were troublesome spirits about, especially on the third floor. I it got I couldn't stand being up there and a friend of mine couldn't even climb the stairs that far as the hair on the back of her neck began to prickle and she got thoroughly frightened into this maelstrom came the, the fateful contact came a fateful contact in April in August of 1945 Parsons met L Ron Hubbard the future founder of Scientology who at that time was known as a little more than a rather eccentric writer of pulp stories. At the time he met, he first met Parsons, he was a naval officer on leave, and Parsons invited him to stay at his house for the remainder of his leave. They had a lot in common. Parsons was very interested in science fiction. Hubbard, for his part, was interested in, in physicism and magic. Anyone who has read the critical biography of Hubbard Bare-Faced Messiah by Russell Miller will understand Hubbard to be a charming and charismatic confidence trickster. Parsons seemed to have been just one more exploitable victim. There is a certain parallel with Parsons' relationship with Smith as Hubbard and Betty started a passionate affair. In spite of this, or perhaps because of this, Parsons' admiration of Hubbard remained unabated. In a letter to Crowley in late 1945, he wrote, Although he, Hubbard, has no formal training in magic. He has extraordinary. He has an extraordinary amount of experience and understanding in the field. From some of his experiences, I deduce that he has. He is in direct contact with some higher intelligence, possibly his guardian angel. He is the most thelemic person I have ever met, and and is in complete accord with our own principles. I think I have made a great gain, and as Betty and I are the best of friends, there is little loss. I cared for her rather deeply, but I have no desire to control her emotions, and I can, I hope, control my own. I need a magical partner, and I have many experiments in mind. The magical partner is a reference to Hubbard, not to a Shakiti, uh, a Shakiti, I don't know what that Shakti. is. Shakti. Oh, a Shakti, or a scarlet woman, as my, <laughs> might at first supposed. In January of 1946, Parsons' mental mate, on the core of working 
working consistent of the utilization of the Enochian tablet of air, or rather a specific ang angle of it, this was to be the elemental, this was to be the focus of, what is that, uh, eight? Yeah. Uh, Roman numeral eight, uh, sexual magic. With the purpose of giving substance to the elemental summons, Parsons continued with this for 11 days, evoking twice daily. He noticed various psychic phenomenon during this period, but felt discouraged by the apparent failure of his operation. However, success followed several days later. In his own words, the feeling of tension and unease continued for four days. Then on January 18th at sunset, while the scribe and I were on the Mojave Desert, the feeling of tension suddenly stopped. I turned to him and said, It is done. In absolute certainty that the operation was accomplished, I returned home and found a young woman answering the requirements waiting for me. She is, descri she is describable as an heir of fire type with bronze red hair, fiery and subtle, determined and obstinate, sincere and perverse, with extraordinary personality, talent, and intelligence. During the period of January 9th to February 27th, I, have, I invoked the goddess of Babylon with the aid of magical partner Ron Hubbard, as, as was proper to one of my grade. Okay. So we got to give the backstory of this a little bit because it does the, this isn't saying a whole lot, but. Well, I don't think we're going to get into the. Not, what, not details, but. Yeah. <laughs> so what, ha so what happens is L. Ron, this guy, L. Ron Hubbard comes around, sees that Jack Parsons is an easy uh, trick, so to speak, to get him. Yeah. He's basically so he's a shyster. Thing. Yeah. Shyster. As we talked about, just interested in money. There's this wealthy guy that's very gullible. Mm -hmm. So L. Ron Hubbard starts sleeping with Jack Parsons wife. This his is a new wife. This is the second guy to do that. Yeah, with the second woman. And Jack is so focused on this magic spirit that he's trying to uh the elemental spirit that he's trying to bring out mm -hmm. that he's totally cool. He's just like, Oh yeah, you can take her too. You can take my <laughs> wife. We're still friends. Like that's cool. Right. And uh prior to this it talked about when he, before he went into the desert that he did something on the third floor and he was troubled by it. Yeah. So he, he was already trying to bring some elemental, which is a spirit or something like that, and invoke, um, I don't know, the this personal spirit. Kind of what we talked about um, with, uh, we talked about the, the New Age mm -hmm. with Marcy, you know, the, the the personal spirit or whatever. So that's what he's trying to do. You mean Marsha? Marsha. Yeah. But, Gotcha. And uh, so th that's what he's trying to do. So he goes out into the desert with L. Ron Hubbard, and they start doing these magical rituals. Rituals. Right, yeah. That's, we'll leave it at that. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. He starts doing these rituals, and all of a sudden he comes back, and there's a woman waiting for him. Yeah. And that's who he thinks. Was the deliverance of the spirit that yeah. he was invoking. Yeah. Yeah. This goddess of Babylon. Yeah. So yeah. now he has this tie with L. Ron Hubbard. Yeah. That he thinks that he helped him. <laughs> he thinks he's like a spirit guide for him almost. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, let's take it up from there. Okay. The young woman referred to as Marjorie Cameron. The more romantic amongst us will perhaps be disappointed to learn that she seems to have existed prior to Parsons Elemental Summons. <laughs> so she didn't just walk in there one right. day. But it's not quite the way he was portraying it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, she and Parsons married in October 1946, and the certificate gives her age as being 24, her birthplace is Iowa, and her profession as artist. At one time, she had served in the U.S. Navy. At the time of this working, she was on a visit from New York where her mother lived and returned there after the Babylon working for a while. So Babylon working was the name of his uh, spirit thing that he was trying to Yeah, bring. yeah, because he was trying to get the goddess of Babylon. Yeah. Yeah. At the end of February 1946, Hubbard went away for a few days. Parsons went back into the Mojave Desert and invoked Babylon, the spirit. He gives no further details of this, unfortunately. All he does say is that during this invocation, quote, the presence of the goddess came upon me and I was commanded to write the following communication. <laughs> this communication, which purports to be the words of Babylon, 
consist of 77 short verses. Whether it was a direct voice, trance, or inspired writing, he does not say. The answer probably lies in the magical record for this period, but as far as I know, it has not survived. This communication of 77 verses he entitled Liber 49. He does not explain the title, but no doubt considered such explanation unnecessary, since 49 is a na number sacred to Babylon. Chapter 49 of Crowley's The Book of Lies is a panegyric to Babylon. This connection is evident in the, vi in the vision and the voice, which is another book, in which Babylon is a strong and alluring cu current, and indeed the core of a series of visions. In the account of the 27th ether of the symbol of Babylon, it is given as a blood red rose of 49 petals, red with the blood of the saints hmm. who have squeezed every last drop into the cup of Babylon. Parsons spent the rest of his life devoted to Babylon. Some would say that he became obsessed by her. Liber 49 contains instructions for the earthing of this Babylon current in the form of an avatar, daughter, or manifestation of Babylon, who is to appear amongst us. It would appear that Parsons was expecting a full-blown incarnation incantation and not simply the incantation of a force so he's expecting carnation incarnation okay yeah in a yet to be published essay parsons discusses the breakup of the patriarchy in the dawn of the 20th century and the beginnings of a new age the age of horus the mm -hmm. nature of this is seen as disruptive bringing confusion and terror parsons instances of two terrible wars the atomic bomb and the increase in obscene and homosexual tendencies. Hmm. This is what he writes. But the great event of the eon, which will bring with it the possibility of redemption of, to the whole of the Western world, has not yet been made manifest. We, who contain the knowledge of this event among ourselves until the time is right, and we who, in fact, were the instruments of its gestation, give these present indications. The eon of Horus is the nature of the child. To perceive this, we, we must conceive of the nature of a child without the veil of sentimentality, beyond good and evil, perfectly gentle, perfectly ruthless, containing all possibilities within the limits of heredity, and highly susceptible, susceptible wow, to training and environment. But the nature of Horus is also the nature of force, blind, terrible, unlimited force. That is why the West stands in, Im in imminent danger of annihilation. That is why the West also stands in the possibility of the most rapid and tremendous evolution that the world has ever known. Hmm. The balance must be love and understanding or all else fails. All right. Want me to take over? Sure. Okay. A few days after receiving Liber 49... Parsons put, in, Parsons put in hand the ritual preparations as indicated in the text, again, in his own words. On March 1 and 2, 1946, I prepared the altar and equipment in accordance with the instructions of Liber 49. The scribe, Ron Hubbard, had, had been away about a week and knew nothing of my invocation of Babylon, which I had kept entirely secret. One, one of the nights on March 2nd, well, he writes, very interesting, uh, one of the night, March 2nd, he returned. I described a vision he had and described a vision he had that evening of a savage and beautiful woman riding naked on, the, on a great cat-like beast. He was impressed with the urgent necessity of giving me some message or communication. We prepared magically for this communication, constructing a temple at the altar with the analysis of the word key, of the key word, he was robed in white, carrying a lamp, and I in black, hooded, with the cup and a dagger. At his suggestion, we played Rachmaninoff's uh, Isle of the Dead as background music and set an automatic recorder to transcribe, tan transcribe audible occurrences. At approximately 8 p.m., he began to dictate, I transcribing directly as I received. Hubbard's vision sounds like he had seen a copy of the Book of, Th of Thoth. Ought. Uh, yeah, just get that. Yeah, whatever. Uh, it's just a book title. Uh, showing the whore astride the beast, where 
would have been at least a one copy of Crowley's book, the book of the Toth, around Parsons' place. Interestingly, in spite of Hubbard being referred to as the scribe, it was Hubbard who was giving utterance to astral communications and Parsons writing them down. As far as the Babylon working is concerned, Hubbard is the joker in the pack, a factor infinite and unknown. His entire career, both before and after his involvement with Parsons, reveals him as a confidence man par excellence. Hubbard's effortless swindling of Parsons out of thousands of dollars demonstrates that Parsons was readily taken in, readily taken in as anyone. The workings arising from Lieber 49 continued for several nights, and they continued. They contained instructions for further rituals intended to facilitate the earthing of Babylon. Some of these communications are of a fierce, intense beauty, as these few excerpts will illustrate. She is a flame of life, power of darkness. She destroys with a glance. She may take thy soul. She feeds upon the death of men. The ritual the first ritual, tomorrow, the second ritual, consecrate all force and being in Our Lady Babylon. Light a single flame on her altar, saying, Flame is Our Lady, flame is her hair, I am flame. Display thyself to Our Lady, dedicate thy organs to her, dedicate thy heart to her, dedicate thy mind to her, dedicate thy soul to her, for she shall absorb three and thou shalt become living flame before she incarnates. For it shall be though, through, though alone, and no one else can help in this endeavor. Some of the communications received in the course of the Babylon working have forceful sexual expression bordering, bordering on rapacious... Rap, They're rapacious. Rapacious. There's words that I just don't know. That's crazy. All it's right. crazy you don't know words? Yes, there's words I don't know. <laughs> All right. uh, thou, thou as a man, and this is what he says next, Thou as a man, as a God, hast strewn upon the earth and in the heavens many loves. These recall. Concentrate, concentrate. Each woman thou hast raped. Remember her, think upon her, move her into Babylon, each one by one, until the flame of lust is high. After the Babylon working, working had been concluded, all that Parsons could do was watch and wait. He had been told the operation had succeeded, that conception had occurred, and that in due, due course the avatar, or daughter of Babylon, would come to him, bearing a secret sign that Parsons alone would recognize and which would prove her authenticity. Hubbard, though, had, had more mundane considerations on his mind, and several weeks later he and Betty absconded with many thousands of dollars of Parsons' money, as an investment fund, allied enterprises set up by, by Parsons, Betty, and Hubbard, into which Parsons was persuaded to sink most of his savings. Parsons eventually managed to track them down, recovering all but a fraction of his money after taking legal action. Parsons had no further contact with either Hubbard or better, Betty following the suit. Parsons was best was beset with other problems, preoccupied with the Babylon working, he had neglected his duties at the Agape Lodge. This was the final straw for many of his peers, who had considered him something of a, a prima donna. The members of the lodge never seemed to have much uh, com compunction in telling tales on each other to Crowley, he re and he received reports from several different sources on his, this latest escapade of Jack Parsons. From these reports, Crowley concluded that Parsons' flaws had finally overcome his promise, and that Parsons was a gullible fool beyond redemption. He was, a, he was further infuriated by Parsons' imitations that, in the interest of secrecy, he could not provide a full account of what had transpired during the Babylon working. Parsons was suspended from his position as the head of the lodge and departed soon after. All right, so we're going to do another little recap since we read quite a bit of that. Yeah. So one of the biggest things is they go out into the desert and L. Ron Hubbard is the one who actually acts as a medium right. and dictates to Parsons what to write down. So all these beliefs are coming through L. Ron Hubbard. And don't forget, he's a science fiction writer. Yeah. <laughs> so. And then after that, 
Imag- Imag- Imagination is not hard for a guy like that. Yeah. So after that. And he's motivated because of Betty. And and Parsons money. Yeah, I was going to say Parsons money is probably yeah. that. Well, Betty, too. He took his wife. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah. So then Betty and uh, L. Ron Hubbard ran off with most of Jack Parsons money. Mm. And then so after that, uh, Alistair Crowley kicks him out of the so, lodge. So he's like, everything's falling apart for Parsons. He's yeah. believing in a false made up goddess that's going to appear to him. Uh, his wife left him, his buddy left him, his spirit guide left him with his money, and then Crowley is, like, fed up with him. So he's, like, everything's falling apart for the guy. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah. A, good, uh, that's a good summary. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I was waiting on. <laughs> there you go. All right. It is difficult to know in great detail what did go on at this time. I have seen a letter which Crowley wrote in 1946, some weeks prior to Babylon working in which he names someone other than Parsons as the Grand Master of the Agape Lodge. I have also seen a reference to Parsons being called to account at a special lodge meeting over certain things which his colleagues were unhappy, such as coming up with a text that was purported to be the fourth chapter of the Book of the Law, which was an act of heresy for which he was luckily not to be burned at the stake. (laughs) And uh, it's important to, we'll, we'll go into Aleister Crowley, but that's a really big deal that he didn't get killed over that. Yeah. Um, so just keep that in mind. It is certain that Parsons departed the OTO at around this time, though he continued to regard himself as a member of the AA. He remained on friendly terms with many of his colleagues, and he continued to correspond with Germer until his death. Not so with Crowley, however. Crowley must have been bitterly disappointed with Parsons. He had had such a high regard for his abilities, as well as a keen awareness of his faults, such as impulsiveness and recklessness, faults which, as Crowley now saw, had led him to the inevitable downfall. Two short letter extracts to Lewis T. Culling show this disappointment. In the course of a letter dated 1946 of October, he wrote about John Parsons. All I can say is that I am sorry. I feel sure that he has fine ideas, but he was led astray firstly by Smith. Then he was robbed of his last penny by a confidence man named Hubbard. And then his last words are in the course of a letter dated 1946. Also Crowley. I have no further interest in Jack and his adventures. He is just a weak minded fool and must go to the devil in his own way. Uh, Requisite in pass. (laughs) The activities of Parsons during the next few years are not at all clear. I've only been able to glance, catch glimpses through letters and the like. In 1948, Parsons lost his security clearance to perform classified government defense work. And a man of his profession, uh, and for a man of this profession, this was the virtual withdrawal of his livelihood. This action was stated to be because of his membership in a religious cult, which believed to be an advocate of sexual perversion, it was organized at the subject's house, and it had not been reported, oh, which had been per- reported subversive. So those are all the things that they took away his clearance for. Hmm. Being in a cult that happened at his house, that believed in sexual perversion, and it had already been It was subversive. Subversive. Yeah. That's probably the kicker, the yeah. subversive part. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Parsons commented later that, he was suspended on charges of belonging to the OTO and circulating Lieber uh, Oz, which is another it's, book or writing. They always have these Lieber. Yeah. yeah. Parsons defended himself in closed court and the car- charges were dropped. In the meantime, Marjorie Cameron left him. <laughs> that was the redheaded. Yeah. In analysis by a master of the temple, Parsons refers to this rift in third person. Okay. Candy appeared in answer to your call in order to wean you from wet nursing. She has demonstrated the nature of woman to you in such unequivocal terms that you should have no further room for illusion on the subject. The suspension and inquisition was my opportunity, one of the final chains in the link. At this time, you are enabled to prepare your thesis, formulate your will, and take the oath of the abyss, thus making it possible, although only partially, to manifest. The exit of candy prepares for the final stage of your initial preparation. Candy is short for Candida, or the magical name of Marjorie Cameron. 
There was a reunion in late 1949 or early 1950, and they resumed living together as man and wife. As mentioned earlier, Parsons still considered himself to be a member of the AA. In December 1948, he took an oath of the Magister Templi in the name Belrion Antichrist. This, are you going to say that? I'm just laughing at <laughs> the, the stuff. is crazy. Yeah. This oath was taken in the presence of Wilter, Wilfred T. Smith, with whom he had evidently retained some sort of relationship. In 1949, he issued the Book of the Antichrist. This is the short text, and in it, he relates how he was stripped of everything that he had and was, and then rededicated to Babylon. This was, he considered, a recharging of his current generated by the Babylon working. He also pledged that the work of the Beast 666 would be fulfilled, and he seems to have seen that work as being, at least in part of, a subversion of Christian ethics. He further prophesied that within seven years, Babylon would manifest, so bringing his work to fruition. <laughs> in September 1950, his employment at Hughes Aircraft Corporation was terminated. He was found to be in possession of a number of classified documents. Several of these, as it, appear, as it happens, co-wrote by him, dating from his days at Caltech. A lengthy investigation by the state attorney and FBI followed. Parsons, it emerged, was hopeful of finding employment in Israel. To this end, he was seeking to persuade them of the case for building a jet propulsion factory complex and had been using the documents for background information. It was eventually concluded that there was insufficient grounds for prosecution since many of the documents should have been by then declassified. However, there were repercussions. The appeals board who had reinstated his security clearance in March 1949, informed him that in their view he no longer had the requisite honesty and integrity. The clearance was withdrawn again in January 1952. Cool. What? Come here. Um, sure. Read? Okay. <laughs> for some in, for, from some incomplete essays that survived from this period, it seems that Parsons was working towards building up some sort of teaching order with the Thelemic core but relating to paganism and witchcraft. By profession, he was now building his own chemical practice. He had sold the main part of his property, the mansion, for purposes of redevelopment and occupied the coach house. The garage was converted into a laboratory, equipped with chemicals and equipment. There was a plan to move to Mexico for a while, both to pursue mystical and magical research and to further his chemical practice. He and Cameron had actually vacated the coach house, and Parsons spent his days moving furniture and chemicals into a trailer. On the afternoon of 17 June 1952, he dropped a container of fulminite of mercury, a highly unstable explosive. The resulting explosion was powerful and devastating, destroying most of the coach house. Horrifically enough, Parsons was still conscious, conscious by the time rescuers got to him. He died an hour later, in the hospital. Controvers controversy has resigned over Parsons' death. Many regard it as unlikely as that a scientist of his ex experience could so mishandle a powerful explosive. During those last days, he wrote that he that was what was probably his last letter to Carl Germer, it, it is bizarre, and it merits quoting in full since it cast light on the frame of mind on his frame of mind at that time. This is what it says. No doubt you will be delighted to hear from an adept uh, who was undertaken the operation of his HGA in, accordant, in accord with our traditions. The operation began auspiciously and with a chromatic display of psychosomatic symptoms and progressed rapidly to acute psychosis. The operator has alternated satisfactorily between manic hysteria and depressing melancholy, stupor, on approximately 40 cycles, and satisfactory progress ha has been maintained in social ostracism, economic collapses, and mental disassociation. These, these statements are mentioned not in, in vainglorious spirit or of conceit, but rather they may serve as comfort and inspiration into the aspirants uh, on the path. Now I am off to the wilds of Mexico for a period also in pursuit of the elusive HGA before winding up 
in the guard room, finally via the booby hotels, the graveyard, or who knows. If the final, if, if the final, you can tell all the little practices that wouldn't have, that I wouldn't have missed it for anything. No one once called 210. The manner of Parson's death brings to mind the association of Babylon with flame. The passage, for she shall absorb thee, and thou shalt become living flame before she incarnates, is particularly haunting. In some of his letters written in the years after, the Babylon working, Parson seemed to be experiencing a violent death, and he almost certainly had his had this similar passages in mind. So uh, that's interesting, though, about the prophecy from Hubbard, well, the the words that Hubbard said yeah. about Babylon when she would come, and then how he was consumed by flame. Yeah, so when he dropped the, the 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 thing. Yeah, and it said he was expecting a violent death. Yeah, yeah. So here's another little interesting bit. Yeah, and uh, we'll wrap it up after this. Okay, this is a really interesting thing. So it says, science fiction writer and illustrator Alva Rogers was witness to the dramatic. Uh, Ambrosier hmm. at Parsons Pasadena Mansion. At the time, Rogers was Amor Am Amaro. Wow, I can't say words either. She was romantically involved with a young <laughs> woman artist who resided there. In his visits, Rogers became acquainted with L. L. Ron Hubbard and John and Betty Parsons. The affair between Hubbard and Betty Parsons seemed to Rogers to charge the house with un unbearable tension. The following is an excerpt from his short memoir of Parsons. So this is part of it. The final desperate act on Jack's part to reverse events and salvage something from the past from the ruin that st stared him in the face occurred in the still, the still early hours of a bleak morning in December. Our room was just across the hall from Jack's apartment, the largest in the house, which also doubled as the temple or whatever of the OTO, we were brought out of a sound sleep by some weird and disturbing noises seemingly coming from Jack's room, which sounded for all the world as though someone were dying or at the very least were deathly ill. We went out into the hall to investigate the source of the noises and found that they came from Jack's partially open door. Perhaps we should have turned around and gone back to bed at this point, but we didn't. The noise, which by this time we could tell was some sort of chant, drew us in exorably to the door which we pushed open a little further in order to better see what was going on what we saw i'll never forget although i find it hard to describe in any detail the room was decorated in a t manner typical to an occultist's lair with all the symbols and uh parts as essential to the proper practice of black magic it was dimly lit and smoky from the pungent incense Jack was draped in a black robe and stood with his back to us, his arms outstretched. In the center of a pentagram before some sort of an altar affair on which several indistinguishable items stood, his voice, which was actually not very loud, rose and fell in a rhythmic chant of gibberish, which was delivered with such passionate intensity that its meaning was frighteningly obvious. After this brief and uninvited glimpse into the blackest and most secret center of a tortured man's soul, we quietly withdrew and returned to our room where we just spent the balance of the night discussing in whispers what we had just witnessed. <laughs> so that's just like a, a window into like his personal devotion to the occult. Yeah. You know, um, I was thinking about this. There was, um, you know, when you think about how his life fell apart, you yeah. know, his he, one marriage failed two marriages fail he loses his money his best friend or his good friend you know uh hubbard and then uh he gets kicked out of the you know the oto and the lodge or whatever by crowley and then he loses his clearance so his government job which was probably paying him pretty good at that point because this is during the war yeah and he's developing rocket fuel and rocket stuff which is really important for the war they were trying to win based on that um it wouldn't surprise me if he would have taken his own life you know, based on all of those things mounting up on him and feeling, feeling as though he had given his life to something that just wasn't mount, that wasn't, you know, helping him or, or meeting his expectations. Yeah. Um, but 
interesting. I just found something I was looking at while you were reading. Uh, it says that in when Parsons was actually a uh, working at Caltech, mm-hmm. he and two other guys started a small company that they called the Suicide Squad. Huh. And um, it was basically they called it that because <laughs> they were a ragtag ragtag group of rocket rocketry enthusiasts whose whose volatile experiments threatened to kill them every time they got <laughs> together. So they called themselves the Suicide Squad, and that was what they named. Uh, their group and their little corporation. And uh, I wonder if if that was not even prophetic in itself, the way that it was working in his life as well. Yeah. You know, just being so, uh, uh, just, I mean, talk about throwing yourself to something. This is what, this is what, it, throwing yourself to something hopeless that will never fulfill. Yeah. You know, it was like um, he was repressed with his homosexuality. So he was probably fighting these, these, you know, unnatural, you know, sexual urges. Mm-hmm. And of course at the culture in 1940s, that was definitely not going to be accepted. Yeah. Not like it would be today anyways. And the cult has such a sexual, um, you know, the cult, cult wor- the occultic world has such a sexual theme to it that's threaded through rituals and the way they do things that it's much more acceptable to have some kind of orgy you know, where you would be able to practice that, you know, desire, you know, and let it out or whatever. Especially under Crowley's supervision or exactly in one of his cults. Right. You know? Yeah. Cause he was sexually charged as well. But, um, I, and I read other places that the mansion there were, it was given to orgies and things like that oh, yeah. often, you know, but I mean, that's how these affairs come about. I mean, the book, yeah. the book kind of kept it clean a little bit, but the stuff that you and I found later when we were looking about the ritual to try and bring bring a bring forth this Babylonian goddess was pretty perverted, yeah, and uh, gross. I won't even repeat it on here, but man, it it just makes me sad for him because it makes me sad that there's nothing there that he was searching after that he would ever find. He'd never find fulfillment. Mm-hmm. You you won't find it in relationships, anyways. We know that. Yeah. So the fact that he gave himself to this like cultic and it never it never like it it never uh, crystallized for him like it never fabricated yeah i mean you'd think that the devil would throw him a bone every once in a while right keep <laughs> keep him on the hook or something right yeah well but he's evil yeah so why would he do that yeah well i mean it it doesn't talk a lot about the science stuff obviously at, that he's going with at the time but i think it's it's one of the reasons why he's such an interesting character and why um this the way that this uh, story that we read was presented with the intimate letters and all that stuff, you know, it's important to keep in mind at the same time that all this stuff is going on. So, you know, in between trips out to the Mojave Desert, he's like inventing stuff that's going like, right. to save, you right, know? Right, right, yeah. <laughs> like inventing solid rocket fuel, you right. know, which is going to enable us to put men on the moon put satellites into space to do all sorts of crazy well, stuff to bomb the Germans, to bomb the Germans, all yeah. their stuff, you know, um, well, and you know, they were working on their stuff too with right. uh, also occult yeah. um, stuff. So it, it's also interesting, Didn't you know, you'll, you'll hear about all this stuff. Maybe we can do a whole episode on the, uh, the occult stuff of the, the world war two and of the germans because they had so much occult stuff like all their scientists basically there's so much stuff with with the occult so it's interesting as kind of uh you know and that came uh a little bit later uh yeah on from when he wasn't doing it because he was doing it a little earlier than they were but it's just interesting to see the uh you know these guys that are men of science so they say are the ones because Let's be honest. Uh, all right. I don't want to say this in a uh, derogatory sense, but I'm going to slam like these Wiccans and New Age people and people that would be into the occult that you would typically think are all these people that ain't doing rocket science. They ain't rocket scientists. You know what I mean? Right. right. They're, they're ones, you know, the the hippie commune, weird stuff of, you know, California and these you know people that live in communes and free love and all this kind of stuff they aren't typically scientists that you would picture that's right you picture like oh we're i'm a novelist i'm you know maybe nowadays 
a communications major. Right. I don't know, something right. like that. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Something not the not the hard scientist. And if you're a communications major and you heard that, I'm not talking about you, baby. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about all the other communications majors that are <laughs> doing stuff <laughs> with a worthless degree. Um, <laughs> wow. Just kidding. Wow. Uh, shots fired. <laughs> uh, whatever. Um, I'm just kidding. Like I said, if you're listening to this, I'm not talking about you. <laughs> you're awesome and smart. Um, but yeah, so it's just interesting to see these the same people back in those days were the hard science guys that are really bringing all the occultic stuff into it. Yeah. And uh, getting results other than that. So, you know, I, I don't want to, uh, this was a long way to say maybe he did get some results in the work that he did outside of the occultic stuff, but the man's life was just miserable. A mess. Yeah. Yeah. Quite a mess. So, yeah, I mean, and it even starts off when he's young. I mean, his parents get divorced. He's a little bit, uh, he's lost, you know, he has this weird interest in, in dark stuff and darkness and the occult and, and he just gets, you know, just like he got put at the wrong place at the wrong time and it just kind of propelled him down, you know, a path. And it's, it's interesting to see that, you know, he wasn't this, uh, he wasn't an L. Ron Hubbard. He wasn't an Aleister Crowley. Right. He never, he, never did. He call. never, like, it seemed like he just got, he was just kind of this weak willed, uh, probably nerdy guy that was into weird stuff. And then he just found himself. I'm not letting him off the hook by any means. Right. But this kid that came from a troubled home and probably really nerdy, socially awkward. And all of a sudden he just fits in with these people that take advantage of him and, you know, there's ultimately no fulfillment to that, like you said. Yeah, nothing. Um, and, you know, I wonder if he, you know, I wonder if, uh, well, we're not going to talk to him because he's probably in hell. We're not going to get to talk right. to him. <laughs> right. <laughs> I was yeah. going to say. I'm yeah. banking on him not being on the side of Jesus. In heaven, yeah. Yeah. He, he was standing in front of a pentagon, a pentagram chanting. So I'm thinking maybe not. Yeah, yeah. But I was going to say, you know, you would ask him if he did get any fulfillment after the scientific stuff that he did, or was it, you know what I mean? Cause I wonder if he got any fulfillment out of that at all. Or... I feel like the interest in the, and it says I, that he would, I would, I would say probably not. Is my right. Answer. Yeah. I don't think he would. Well, they also say that his, at, he went to Caltech to do research, but he was, he never got a degree or anything. Oh yeah. So he never really like got, I think he did get a degree. accomplished or anything. I don't think so. I was looking at some stuff here about it. Oh. And uh, it 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 just it, I mean the guy was probably pretty sharp, like adaptable, uh, and there's that whole alchemical, you know, uh, way of working through the occult. You know what I'm talking about? Like the uh, they want to you know people want to be changed so they can become better and mm-hmm. into this new higher self and all that kind of stuff. And that's part of that whole passage through the occult. And I'm wondering if uh, the mixing with all the chemicals for the rockets and stuff was the interest in get, thinking maybe he would stumble upon something that could actually work well with some of his like occultic stuff. Hmm. You yeah. know, I don't know. I wonder that. Yeah. Who knows? And I was going to say, uh, not to psychoanalyze cause I'm by no means a psychiatrist or thing with that, but it's also interesting to see, you know, why would someone, you know, that's obviously brilliant brain, you know, brainiac very smart and intelligent um in matters other than book science you know i'd say other than that he's kind of weak-willed is you know what makes him seek out this thing and particularly this thing with women you know because it said he, the oedipus the thing that you were joking about the oedipus complex is uh based on this old i'm not sure if it's myth, a myth or the story whatever it's of oedipus rex Hmm. which is basically this guy who kills his father to marry his mother. Nice. So that's the whole background of this, which brings into a lot of light if people would have recognized that. Yeah. Of this elemental spirit to come in. That was of a woman, you know, that he was always waiting on. Hmm. And, uh, you know, so it seems like, (laughs) you know, (laughs) we just, you got to look behind one of the, you know, guy, one of the most brilliant, you know, probably scientists and can, concluded you know brought us so much stuff and uh, in the 20th century yeah and you know just to look at him is uh he's a miserable dude that uh you know 
was yeah. Sad. dancing around with some evil people. So the moral of the story is don't get into the occult. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Unless you want to be unless you want to be a well, here's the thing that I think a is brilliant rocket scientist because maybe maybe it's worth it for you. No, no, it's never worth it. It's uh, never worth it. Look, he I'm went down kidding. he went down a flame of glory. Yeah. Um <laughs> Um here's what's interesting to me too. It's like birds of a feather, right? Like mm. Ron L. Hubbard, Alistair Crowley, L. Ron Jack Hubbard. Part, L. Ron Hubbard, like they all kind of hung together, you know, and they were all crossing paths, and and somehow they were all, you know, they knew each other. I'm, it's ha- you know, Hubbard had to have known Crowley, in or of him at least, you yeah. know. I'm sure Parsons talked about him and stuff. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. And but um, but isn't that crazy how like they all kind of hung together, and um, and then Hubbard goes off to create some false religion scientology yeah which is still active today yeah and And i wonder if just thinking of this now i wonder how much of the money that he got from parsons actually helped him launch the church in the first place yeah i don't know i mean he said it was like twenty thousand dollars or something like that yeah but in the 40s that's a lot of money that is a lot of money i don't think it said 20 i think it was more than that oh really yeah i thought it was all he all he got back was twenty thousand yeah so it might have been, you know, a lot more. Yeah. It could have been equatable in today's money, you know, as like million or more, I millions million, possibly. A couple hundred thousand maybe. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Who knows how much they actually got? I mean, we know. we could. Oh, yeah. We don't know how much they actually got. You know, so. for, their, for their little company that they started. Wow. So that's pretty interesting, man. The old Jack Parsons. So uh, anyways, I guess we'll be, grat- we'll be grateful for him as we go to the moon. Yeah. Right? If it happened. If the moon even existed. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> All right, man. Well, this has been a good episode. It's been fun. Yeah. And uh we've got some more we're gonna we're gonna dive into Alistair Crowley a little bit later, uh, not not in the next week or so, but at some point here we'll dive into him. And uh we've got some cool cool guests coming up here soon on the podcast as well. So hey man. Yeah. You got anything else you want to share? No. We wrap not. wrap up wrap up this first one of 2020. Yeah, let's go. Let's do, let's, let's wrap, put it in the books. Yeah. Let's, all right. It's over. All right, <laughs> warriors. We'll catch you next time on All Out War. See ya. Stay hydrated. Stay hydrated. That's right. We'll see you. Thanks for listening to the All Out War podcast today. We hope you enjoyed the episode. If you want to know more, you can visit us on the web at alloutwar.us or you can find us on Twitter at alloutwarcast. Hey, thanks again for listening, and we'll catch you next time.